They are usually the oddest in the band, the guy who at some stage in his life has decided that the instrument with the least amount of strings would be his thing. He's the guy who chooses to stand up the back and concentrate on the drummer's foot. He's the guy who the girls usually don't notice, but he's the engine room of any fine outfit, the man who holds it all together. And there's no finer bass guitarist <laughs> than Guy Pratt. He's supposed to be nice to him, which is supposed to be, nah, you know, encouraging. <laughs> anyway, not content with sharing the stage for years with the world's best musicians, Guy is a successful author and stand-up comic as well, and he's in Australia for his one one-man show, My Bass and Other Animals. Good morning, Guy. Good morning. Good morning Welcome. Guy. The name of your one-man show, it's just occurred to me, there was a, was it Lawrence Durrell or Gerald, Gerald Durrell? Gerald Durrell had a book called My Family and My Other Family and Other Animals. Yeah, so it should actually be, to scam probably, it should be My Bass Guitar and Other Animals. But it was, so when I started doing the stand-up show, that's what the show's called, when I started doing it, it was like my agent said, well, you've got to think of something with the word bass in it, because no one knows who you are, you know, as you, you so clearly pointed out at the beginning <laughs> of, the, of the segment. And, uh... And, and it's really hard to come up with anything with the word bass in it that doesn't sound like some really awful jazz fusion solo record. Totally you know? addicted to bass. Or, yeah, bass mm. instinct. <laughs> Basically, you know, they're all just ghastly. <laughs> <aren't> yes, <laughs> carnal what... knowledge sounds better, doesn't it? What does? <laughs> <laughs> At what point do you, do you, as a, you know, you're a bass player and you're playing with all these amazing bands and you're touring the world, at what point do you kind of go, hey, I'm a funny guy, I need to take this to the world as, as a comedian? Yeah, where's my share? Um, well, part of it is because most of the bands I play with live, like, you know, I was here with Brian Ferry last year, and when I play with David Gilmour, Pink Floyd or whatever, it's like you're on stage with 11 people, and you're at the back, and you've, you've kind of got to cock up really quite badly before anyone notices. So I, I kind of <laughs> like, like the idea of actually sort of um, just having it all on my shoulders for once. But what, at what point do you say, right, I'm going to take my hilarity and I'm going to stand on stage yeah it's, it's sort of at the point emotionally where you, naked emotionally naked there is that mm. sort of at the point when you're completely out of work uh, all out of ideas of what to do and realize you've got a choice of either being that bloke down the pub who everyone goes don't get him started <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or, or you can try and sort of do something constructive with it D does it does it come from all of those ridiculous funny and unprintable stories that happen on the road or, or is it is it something more than that? No, um, no it, kind of, it, it kind of is essentially that. The thing, I also thought, there's never been a hard hand who's done a show. There's lots of artists who do shows. But in order, you know, like Ray Davis does one. And people, but, but you've got to be interested in that artist. Whereas my, I, this is from the point of view of someone I've been kind of everywhere. I mean, if you come to my show, if, if there'll be someone that you know of and, and are interested in. And uh, also... It's, oh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. It was a really stupid idea. I mean, the, funny, the funniest <laughs> thing about it is, is that, is that after years and years and years of, um, you know, when you're a musician, people forever saying to you, oh, you're so lucky to do something you love. How brilliant to do something you love. Oh, marvellous to do something you love. And then you become a stand-up. People go, you're so brave! <laughs> oh, you're so brave. It's like you suddenly become a fireman or something. It's like, no, it's still the same self-serving, needy, insecure... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> performance anxiety type. Yeah, yeah exactly. Are you, possibly, are you possibly the only funny bass player in the world? Yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's not true. All musicians are funny. All musicians are funny. Do you know, it's... I've... Uh, actually, that's not true, is it? No, There's it's... a couple of singers. But no, but generally, music... <laughs> <laughs> musicians are funny. I mean, very, even in, you know, because if you're in some dreadful tour or recording situation, there's always a certain gallows humour that's yeah, yeah, involved. Yeah. And you see, you, you see people on the edge the whole time, too. I mean, that whole performance thing. What do you mean? You, you, <laughs> you're constantly <laughs> seeing people on the edge. Yeah. Uh, what is it, just before we get into the bands that you've played with and so on, what, what is the responsibility of a bass player? He's got responsibility. Uh, yeah, you're kind of well. As you said, the foundation. You're, you're essentially you're the link between the, the, the between the rhythm and the harmony. You're the guy who kind of lays it down. You know, the, you're the thing between the music and the drums, essentially, holding you know holding it all together. And why is someone drawn to the bass? That I really couldn't tell you because I certainly wasn't. I, I mean, I, were you a guitar player first? No, I wasn't. I wanted to be a guitar player. Um, you know, I, I, I fell in love with rock and roll and wanted an electric guitar. And of course, back then it was different. Now if, it's completely accepted. You, kids learn about pop music at school. We didn't mind her. You know, that was just noise made by long-haired cretins. And yes. you so, can't make a living out of that. Well, anyway. exactly. You know, and, and so when, when I asked for an electric guitar, you know, my mum just said, "Oh, darling, get a nice Spanish guitar." And it's like, well. It was the electric bit I was interested in. Yeah. You know, to be honest, a toaster would have been closer to what I was after than, than a Spanish guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's extraordinary that, that somewhere in that kind of ambivalence really towards it, you, you became this great talent. Well, yeah, I was very lucky in the... I mean, cos I, I managed to talk my parents into getting me a bass guitar cos they didn't really know what it was, and neither did I. And this thing turned out and it was huge, it had four strings, and you stand in front of the mirror and do that and go, well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not much good, is it? a very nice noise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then... But I stuck with it, and the funny thing was, was kind of my 
sort of um, salad of my glory years, if you like, in my 20s, was the 80s. And that was the one decade where the bass, you know, was, was the real standout instrument. Yeah. You know, yeah. it couldn't be too loud, too flash, or wear it too high. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> See, that was a bad look. You, you're, you're, you're going back to the, when you were in your 20s and the 80s, uh, and you got this gig yeah. with Pink Floyd. I mean, they were a behemoth, weren't yeah. they? I mean, and, and, and the live show was just massive lights and, and flying pigs and crumbling walls. But the, the, the split, when Roger Waters, the bass player, yeah. and, and he was the mainstay of that band, really, with, there was an acrimonious split. It must have been very daunting to step into his shoes. Well, it wasn't. I mean, it's, it wasn't really, because I wasn't actually stepping into his shoes. And Because, uh, I mean, I could, although there was this big thing, a lot of the fans hated me for years. until. But luckily, I've consistently failed to write any grand conceptual <laughs> masterpieces, so they've kind of come to accept me now. <laughs> Because <laughs> I mean, the thing is, really was, Roger really wasn't the bass player. I mean, that was the thing. He was, he was the conceptualist, yeah. he, he was the lyricist, he wrote most of the big ideas. You know, he, the fact he played bass because that was kind of, you know, because yeah. like, back in the, that, it, that, that was the instrument that was left over. To be honest, I think David actually played bass for most of the records. But um, David Gilmore, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, tell us about your, your first meeting with him because as I, as I read the story, it was... It's quite hilarious. You, you kind of thought that you were sort of being introduced to him. Yeah, he... apparently it was through this guy, Nick Laird Clues, who, because um, I'd... Um... I played for this band called Dream Academy, and David produced them. And Nick's one of those people that had that big hit, Life in a Northern Town, back yeah. in the 80s. I think it was a hit here. Yeah, it was. And, um, yes, huge hit. And he... Uh, and Nick's this incredibly enthusiastic character. Like, and apparently David heard a demo or something that I'd played on. And Nick said, God, David Archie, he thinks you're amazing. He's just dying to meet you. He thinks you're the best thing ever. Which translates to David probably went, oh, the bass is all right. <laughs> you know, and, it's, and uh, you, know, he's, you know, David is the most nonchalant man in the world. And... and uh, and so we, we got a gig supporting David on his first solo tour at the Birmingham Odeon. And we went up, and there was this whole thing of like, Guy, you've got to come, he's waiting for you. He's in here, he's in the dressing room, he just wants to see you. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> and, and of course, this just wasn't true at all. <laughs> you know, David was just kind of in the dressing room waiting to do his show, bored, picking at the buffet, you know. And so I was, I was, shoved, I was shoved up to him, David, this is Guy. Guy, this is David. And I just stood there. And, <laughs> Until it was so awful, one of us had to just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the big meeting. Well, yeah, it was a big meeting. I think David, being the ranking officer, was the one who walked away. Um... <laughs> was it though? Was it? Was were you scared of him? Or terrified. Were you... I, mean, I was terrified of him for a long time. Oh, and he, he's Why? Much... No, well, not really. he's a, he is a, a guitar god. I mean, he's a true, genuine legend of the guitar, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. And it, it, to play with people like that. It's, I mean, that, that's got to be... Do, do, no, it's you... still... I mean, I've probably... I've played Comfortably Numb probably about 300 times with him. And still, when we go into that second solo, so the hairs go back um, up on the back of my neck still, you know. Yeah. He does stuff Never with a guitar over. that no-one else can do. No. And it's qu quite unique, really, isn't it? Yeah, do, it's, does... it's, just his, it's just those fingers. So that mean... Does that make you play better? Well, yeah, well, the th that's the thing. Well, there's not really that much opportunity with Pink Floyd, because obviously Roger wrote a lot of the bass lines. But it was... Um, no, I mean, the, it's... The bass work with Pink Floyd tends to be very, very basic. And, and the thing is that my job is to kind of look after that and try and not imprint myself on it too much. I mean, I used to in the early days. Um, like, the first live album I did with it, this thing's like, the reggae break in Money will haunt me to the end of my days, as will my slap playing in Brick in the Wall. Oh, God. <laughs> but, hey, it was the 80s. Uh, who yeah. knew? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, so, but, I said, but the beauty of that is it actually means, because I, I have to be really simple and just sort of lock it down, it means I get to listen to David. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that. you know, and up till recently, you know, and Rick, who's... Yeah, yeah. Who's yeah. Very yeah. Sad. Okay. You, you had um, a different experience with Madonna, though, didn't you? Uh, yes. Well, because... I never toured with Madonna. It was quite funny because uh, working with her in the studio was, was great fun. I mean, she, has, she used to brighten up every day. She had this charming little catchphrase. Time is money and the money is mine! <laughs> um... <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So she's an absolute tyrant. <laughs> no, she's not. I mean, she, she, I mean, she was actually quite cool back then. This was back in like '89 when I did like a prayer. That was '88, '89. I did two albums with her, and and she still had an element of kind of New York street smart before she just became the insane Elizabeth Taylor character she is today. And uh, but she did... so, at, at what point did you date her? And why was there no paparazzi cameraman there? But unbelievable! I didn't date her. She, I got. She asked me out. It was this thing of. Um, That's a date. I suppose so. Well, no, she'd asked everyone out. That's the funny thing. <laughs> she, um, she's invited the band. Uh, you know, I was in LA, we were working in the studio, and it was uh, all these kind of 
real grown-up musicians whose names I knew from Steely Dan records. It was terrifying. They could run with scissors and everything. And, uh, and she came on and they said, who wants to go see George Michael tonight? You know, and everyone just sort of went, mm. <laughs> And I went, I, I, I wouldn't mind. Um, perhaps, oh, pick up an eight, eight, eight. All right, go. <laughs> so, you know, so wary. Uh, and it was funny, actually, because eight is slightly before eight. Uh, and... <laughs> But she came and picked me up. And this was George Michael, right, on the Faith Tour, at the absolute yeah. height of his yeah, powers, yeah. at the LA Sports Arena, you think you're going with Madonna. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like ground zero showbiz, play, you know, a place to be in the world that night. So she came and she picked me up in the limo and we drove out. And it was all very... She was very sweet and charming, quite vulnerable when you got her on her own in the car. Very nice. And um, we get to the LA Sports Arena and the driver comes and opens the door and we get out. She actually puts her arm in mine. And I think, wow, it's fantastic. And we walk arm in arm, me with Madonna, to see George Michael at the LA Sports yeah. Arena yeah. on the Faith Tour. And it was funny, cos it's the only public event she's probably ever been to where there wasn't one single photographer! <laughs> 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 it's a lie. It's actually a lie. Like, exactly. <laughs> I made it all up and, uh, yeah. well, she went and found another guy anyway, didn't she? Well, yeah, but that didn't last. Guy. No, no, no. Oh, do you know, that's something that really annoyed me, cos obviously divorce is a very, very sad thing, especially when there's kids involved. Uh, but. But I did think, after, let's face it, because we thought there's going to be all this wrangling over the fortune, which has been accrued over the last few years by rubbish records and really bad films. And I thought, at last, Guy and Madonna are going to earn their keep and give us a few months of genuine entertainment. <laughs> but they haven't. <laughs> They've just gone, no, that's fine, done. What? <laughs> it's a good point. Uh, Michael so Jackson, well, you, you, you worked with Michael Jackson. What was he like in the studio? Well, <laughs> that's a real, well, that's a funny, that was actually from Madonna. It was because um, cause the, the bass playing on Like a Prayer at uh, the end section is a, very, it's a particular type of bass playing. Um, the technical term is showing off. And, uh, <laughs> and Michael Jackson heard that and went, mm, uh, ooh. Sorry? Uh, which apparently translates as, I particularly like that style of bass playing and think it would be appropriate for my next record. <laughs> you've got to have known him for a while to, to see that. And, uh, and the weird thing is, I turned up to do this record, which was nothing like that. It, um, it was Earth Song, which is just all, what about sunlight, what about trees, you know? What indeed? And, uh, <laughs> and he was never there. He was never in the studio. And, and, and I, so I kept having to go back this way. Well, like this, didn't like that, could do that. I was like, oh, come back. And I like this, didn't like that. And, I, and eventually I said, well, look, if he could just be here, he could tell me what he wants and, you know, we'll do it. Go, we can all go home. And they said, quick, Mike, come down the studio. Michael here is not leaving. And I get down the studio. Michael's just left. It's like, oh, God. But there was this new engineer in the studio who was like, who didn't look like a recording engineer. Because recording engineers, you, you'll know, they're a particular type of people. They're very thin, wan. Uh, they see less daylight than badgers. Yeah, nervous. Uh, nervous. They live on roll-ups and biscuits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but respond surprisingly well to kindness. Uh, <laughs> 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 and this guy was like this huge Samoan bloke. It, like more, more, it looked like he'd be more used as a bodyguard or something. And he was down one end of the desk. And I tried to get an ashtray or something. This bloke was blocking my way. Couldn't get it down there. And so, all right. And, and then every time I played something, this guy would lean over right, behind the desk and go, yeah, I think Michael would find that appropriate. <laughs> really? That's what it suddenly occurred to me. Someone was actually hiding behind the mixing desk, telling this guy what to tell me. I thought, oh, my God, Michael Jackson is hiding behind the mixing How desk. Bizarre. And he was. He was hiding. And we all had to go... I was looking at Bill, the producer, you know, trying to get his eyes going, don't look at me, don't look at me, don't look at me. And we just all had to go along with this thing that Michael wasn't there, and somehow this Samoan bodyguard knew exactly what <laughs> Michael would require from a bass performance. It, there must be an overwhelming temptation to say, hello, I can see you. There, there really wasn't. Especially well, not with this bunch no, exactly. standing between me. <laughs> Guy, look, we're, we're, unfortunately, we're out of time. Right. You've got you've got an, another show uh, tomorrow, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night at the Sydney? factory in Sydney. Yeah, you weren't able to play in Melbourne. I wasn't able to play in Melbourne, no, I, uh, but I, I, I can come back. Right, excellent. It's <laughs> lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for your time this morning and thank you so much for all the music that you've given oh, us. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Look forward thank to you. the laughs now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll be back after this.